Kit Carson is one of those guys that I think is almost better known for his fictional a aspect. I mean, this is a guy that was the subject of hundreds of comic books and um, these original pulp novels that were called Blood and Thunders and bad TV shows and bad movies. Uh, and so what we know about this guy is, is skewed and, and is sort of um, uh, muddied by this cumulative history of, of, uh, of uh, fictionalizing. So when I decided to write a book about him, I, I kind of wanted to peel back the layers of all the fiction and try to get to the real guy. And it turned out the real guy was uh, infinitely more interesting than the fictional character. I just found that he was one of these almost zealot characters who, even though he was, in, in a sense, powerless, he was, a, he was an illiterate runaway from Missouri, he, he knew everyone in the West, on the Western stage. He um, intersected with all these historical figures uh, and was intimately involved in uh, exploration in the West, um, in the Mexican-American War, um, in the uh, Civil War, in the Indian Wars. Uh, this is a guy who sort of intersected with history, big history, um, it, but in an intimate way. So I decided to, to devote uh, a book and, and about four or five years of my life to trying to figure out who this guy was, Kit Carson. Carson came out here really in, in a way to escape America. He was a runaway and he had heard all these stories about the Wild West and uh, wanted to be one of these mountain men, one of these fur trappers. Uh, he did come out to New Mexico. He intersected with these guys. He became an intimate part of their world, which was mainly a French-based uh, culture. He learned French and, and became fluent in French and lived with these guys and learned the river systems of the West, you know, basically hunting beaver pelts. Um, but because he knew all the rivers, because uh, that was the, really the key to understanding the topography and uh, understanding uh, how to get around here. Uh, when the U.S. Topographical Corps sent an expedition under uh, John C. Fremont to explore the West, they needed a guide. And uh, Fremont realized that these mountain men knew the West better than anyone. So he hired Kit Carson as a guide. And Carson uh, acquitted himself very well on these expeditions. He saved many people's lives and uh, kept the expedition on, on track. And uh, um, so he became, in Fremont's reports, uh, which became best-selling books, um, Carson becomes kind of a hero in these stories. Um, but no one could seem to find this guy because he was living in New Mexico and was uh, never coming back east. Uh, so he was kind of this um, mythic character that people wanted to you know, know a little bit more about. Um, and, uh, and, and so when the Blood and Thunder books became uh, more and more famous, uh, more and more popular, uh, Kit Carson was, was often the central character in these stories. These authors uh, back east who wrote these terrible stories, I mean, I would dare you to, to read them actually. They, they're, not, they're not good but in terms of literature. But um, these authors never really made any attempt to understand who the real Kit Carson was. They didn't, they didn't get his consent to use his name. Kit Carson did not make any money off these books. He hated these books because they were, you know, gross exaggerations and they set up this kind of caricature that he had to spend the rest of his life trying to live down. Um, uh, they, they would say things like, Kit Carson was the kind of man who would kill two Indians before breakfast, you know, which was considered, I guess, a good thing back then. And uh, so, in fact, he was married to an, a Native American and uh, was a very close uh, friend to many tribes in the, in the West. Uh, so these are the kinds of things he had to spend um, most of the rest of his life uh, living down. He did not understand where this was coming from, why people back East so desperately seemed to need this hero, this uh, character who would personify, manifest destiny. Um, and um, whenever he went back East, people refused to believe that, that he was the real Kit Carson, because the real Kit Carson was five foot four, he was awkward around people, he spent most of his life on a mule, so he, he had this kind of awkward gait that, um, you know, he wasn't this hero heroic action figure type guy that was portrayed in The Blood and Thunders. So there was this disconnect, 
And people would say things like, well, you're not the kind of Kit Carson I, I'm looking for. Uh, you know, they were sorely disappointed. Um, so I spent a lot of time in the book sort of um, trying to uh, explore uh, the ways in which Carson tried to deal with this celebrity. It was a very uh, awkward thing for him. With these Blood and Thunder books, Carson had another problem, uh, which was he couldn't read them because he was illiterate. So he had to have other people, perhaps around the campfire, um, read these books to him, uh, which was a source of embarrassment, and uh, it, just, it just made it all the worse. Um, there was one time in which Carson's celebrity from the Blood and Thunders sort of intersected with the real Kit Carson, and that was in, um, in the 1840s when he got a, um, an assignment to go uh, try to find a woman, a white woman, Anne White was her name, uh, who had been kidnapped by Apaches. And he followed the trail for five, six, seven, almost a, maybe closer to two weeks before he did find Ann White. And um, the element of surprise was, was compromised and various things happened and uh, she ended up getting killed. And when, they, when Carson and his men went down to the camp site uh, to sift through her belongings, what did they find? They found a Blood and Thunder book that she had evidently been reading. And the star of this Blood and Thunder book was Kit Carson. And the plot line of the book was Kit Carson was sent out to go rescue a woman who had been kidnapped by Indians. Um, so here she was reading this book thinking perhaps Kit Carson was near. She gets killed. And Carson, in the real story, uh, you know, was not able to save save this woman. And uh, this just haunted him for the rest of his life. And uh, he ordered the book burned. He thought these Blood and Thunder books were terrible. So um, there, there are interesting ways in which uh, kind of like mythology intersects uh, with reality in his story. One of the most famous stories about Kit Carson that was told during his time that is actually true. Now, you got to understand a lot of these stories are not true. I mean, the more you dig into them, you find, um, mm, pretty suspicious. Uh, but one of the ones that's actually true is um, during the Mexican War, he was in the, a battle near San Diego called San Pascual, and uh, the American army uh, had become uh, surrounded by a, a Mexican Californian army that was wielding lances, uh, almost like uh, Don Quixote or something. They, they were remarkably proficient with these lances, and they were just uh, butchering the American army, they were really good at it, and they were uh, these the, the American soldiers were getting gored and um, uh, just ripped to pieces by these these long lances that um, almost like a jousting kind of thing in mid medieval times. Um, so they were surround completely surrounded, and it was just a matter of time before they were all going to be killed. And Kit Carson was given the assignment to to try to make it to San Diego, uh, where there were supposedly some Marines on a uh, out in the bay on a ship and maybe go get help somehow. So Carson um, at night slips through the, this, this ring of, of uh, Mexican soldiers somehow, but in the course of slipping through their, um, uh, this, this line of soldiers, he lost his shoes and he had to walk 30 miles to San Diego barefoot uh, across this country that was just uh, just unbelievably difficult and thorny and uh, full of cactus. And uh, so he, he does do this. He makes it to San Diego. He makes it to this ship. Uh, they immediately take him to the infirmary. His feet are just completely torn up, and you know, he's just a bloody mess. He can't walk. Uh, but, he, but he gets there. He alerts the Marines of what's happening. The Marines come and save the American Army. And, and Carson... Um, is meanwhile just in the hospital for you know, three or four weeks as, because his feet become infected. And, uh, and he, he never t told this story, he never talked about it. It was something that uh, you know, he was always reluctant to put himself in the center of a story. But in a way, he saved, he saved the American army in, in, the, in this situation. And uh, um, there are stories like this uh, throughout his life um, where whenever there's some something going on that uh, you know the chips are down Carson somehow gets the assignment to to fix the situation and he does uh, and this is certainly one of the best known uh, by the end of his life when he when he dies the the transcontinental railroad is being built um, 
most of the tribes that he was close to had been rounded up and, uh, and uh, sent to re various reservations. His main impact, though, I think what he's probably most famous for is for one of the very last things he did in his life, which was the, the roundup uh, of the Navajo Indians. Um, the large, what, what is now really, depending on how you count uh, numbers uh, with, among tribes um, and bloodlines and this sort of thing, it's, it's the largest tribe in the United States. Um, he succeeded in rounding up the Navajos and moving them to a, uh, uh, a reservation 500 miles away. And uh, the destruction of the Navajo culture and, uh, and, their, and this long walk, as they call it, is something that is... Uh, it's almost like it happened yesterday in terms of the Navajo and their memory of this. And uh, they hate Carson. They think he's uh, a genocidal character and they think he's, um, you know, everyone hates their conqueror, uh, but, but their, their hatred of Carson is, is palpable. Um, and so, you know, so he's a very controversial character out here in the Southwest. And I was drawn to that because here's a guy who's the subject of all these juvenile biographies and he's considered an American folk hero. And yet he's also considered uh, a genocidal maniac. Uh, and so, you know, how do you, how do you reconcile these, these two very different uh, uh, images? I structured the book uh, in th into three parts. Uh, the first part, The New Men, is, is really about the arrival of the Americans um, uh, into the Southwest um, during the time of, the, of both the, the Mountain Man era, um, leading to Fremont's expeditions into the, into the West, and then finally, um, the American Army's arrival during the Mexican War. Um, so it, it's really just kind of, sh from shifting perspectives, it sort of shifts from, various Native American points of view to Mexican points of view, you know, and who is this new arrival, the, the new men? Uh, the, you know, what, what, are, what are they about? Why are they here? What do they want with this desert country out here? Um, so that's part one. Part two is called A Broken Country. And basically it looks at um, the beginning of what you might call occupation. It's like the conquest of the West was remarkably easy and, and fairly um, straightforward. Uh, but con uh, conquest was one thing. Occupation is something different. And I think we've certainly as a nation discovered this uh, and learned this very hard lesson in Afghanistan and, and certainly in Iraq. Uh, it's like it's one thing to conquer a people, uh, at least on paper. It's a, an entirely another thing to try to uh, occupy and govern a land, especially one as complicated as this, uh, this desert kingdom with all these different languages and religions and, uh, you know, it, basically for the first 50 years, almost, uh, you know, certainly, certainly first several decades, um, people back in Washington were saying, what, what have we done here? We, uh, we've conquered this land, but we do not understand it and we can't govern it. We should just give it back. We should give it all back to Mexico. It's, it's too hard to, to, um, to, to, to run this place. Um, just a little, there was just so much violence. There was, you know, a, a slavery and uh, there was a, a hostage taking. And, um, you know, it was just an unfamiliar country that people in Washington didn't, didn't know what to do with. So that's part two. Um, part three is really about Kit Carson's role in the conquest of the Navajo people and everything he did with that, um, Monster Slayer, it's called. And uh, uh, this was sort of the final act of his long career, and it's probably what he's best known for, um, this sort of a scorched earth campaign that he led into Navajo country that resulted in their, their conquest and their removal from their beloved lands and uh, this great experiment that went on to try to force the Navajo to become... Uh, to settle down and become farmers and Christians living, living in this sort of reservation in, uh, uh, on the border with Texas. So it's, um, it's, a, it's a big sprawling book that has many parts. And uh, the remarkable thing is that Kit Carson kind of is, is, the, is the through line that makes it make all, you know, that makes it make sense. Uh, he, he, uh, he just uh, intersected with all these different aspects of, of, of history out here. When I wrote the book, I was really worried uh, about the sort of political correctness uh, aspect of it. And because the book is constantly shifting its point of view, I'm writing about Pueblo Indians, and then I'm writing about the Apaches, um, then I'm writing about uh, 
Anglo-Americans and the French folks from the mountain man days and the Spanish, of course. And, um, you know, it's just easy to put your foot in. A, it's a minefield, let's put it that way. And I was, I was worried that um, I was offending people, you know, left, right, and center, because there's so many people out here, so many different cultures. Um, uh, but that didn't really happen. I don't think, uh, you know, I, certainly there's some criticism. There's always criticism uh, in, when you write a book this big. Um, but I was surprised uh, by how many, you know, how many um, people have responded favorably to the book. Um, even the Navajo, who cannot stand Kit Carson and who uh, have asked me at various times, like, why would you write a book about this guy? You know, uh, he's, he's as evil as Hitler or, or Genghis Khan or something. Um, I went out to Navajo country to give a talk at Ship Rock, and a very nice woman bought the book, and she stood up asked me a question, uh, and she was holding the book, and she said, I, you know, I bought the book, and I'm going to take it home, and, and I'm going to try to read it, but most likely I'm just going to use it for target practice. Um, so she had a sense of humor about it, and uh, was very polite about it, but she, uh, you know, it spoke to the depth of the feeling that's out there uh, against Carson in Indian country. I started out the book uh, believing that uh, Carson was one of the great Indian killers, that he was this, somehow uh, an Indian hater, that he had this ferocious dislike of, of Indian culture, because that's what you will certainly hear, for example, out in Navajo country. Um, but when you get into his life, you realize it's very complicated. Um, he spoke numerous Indian tongues. He, his first wife, uh, who was a Rapaho, singing grass, was the love of his life. Um, they had two daughters. Um, his second wife was Cheyenne. Uh, he was very close with the Ute tribe and uh, with the Taos Pueblo Indians and uh, with the, uh, many of the Plains Indian tribes. So it becomes much more complicated when you realize that, I mean, you can't say this is an Indian hater. Uh, he was someone who allied himself with certain tribes and was sort of a bitter enemy uh, against other tribes. He didn't really think monolithically about American Indians. He thought specific tribes. Uh, and um, the sort of the last tribe that he affiliated himself with was, if you want to call it that, was uh, Spanish, the Spanish tribe of, of New Mexico. He became Spanish almost. Uh, his third and final wife was Spanish. They raised their kids here in New Mexico. He converted to Catholicism. Um, they spoke Spanish. Uh, you know, and uh, he, he dreamed in Spanish, he thought in Spanish, his last words uh, before, right before his death were in Spanish. Um, so the enemy of the Spanish in those times here in New Mexico, the, the sort of mortal enemy was the Navajo. So I think that's kind of the, the way he thought in terms of tribal allegiances that ran deep. And uh, so when he got the assignment to go round up the Navajo, uh, he was willing to do it. Uh, it doesn't mean that he hated Indians. Um, it meant that he still thought, I think, in this kind of tribal way. And uh, uh, I think that explains a lot better his motivation for doing what he did.